I've done the arc of attrition three times now. Now the first time I did it, I took my camera with me on the run. Most of you, hopefully most of you, will have seen that film. I know you all want me to take the camera with me on the run and make another film like I did two years ago. And I will do that again. It may be next year, it may be the year after, we'll just have to see. But this year I did the same thing again as last year. I gave the camera to my children. This year though I think they did a little bit of a better job of uh, keeping filming during the whole race. So we have got most of the checkpoints in this time. So let's start at the very beginning. And the very beginning is well before the race starts. Honestly, has there ever been a race where so many people have had so much trouble just getting to the start line? It was incredible. We got caught in a snowdrift on the A38 heading down just out of Exeter, but we didn't get caught in the main blockage that happened at the top of Bodmin Moor on the A30. I know so many people got caught in that. My friend Richard got caught in it. He was there all night, didn't make the race. And I know from 192 entries to the Ark of Attrition, 190 something entries to the Ark of Attrition, there were 30 odd people who didn't even make it to the start line because of the snow. We made it to our hotel in Camborne late evening, managed to get a decent amount of sleep and we were up for breakfast in the morning. And then we got in the car and made our way down to registration. So we're on our way to register for the ARC 2019. It's been an absolutely terrible, terrible night of uh, getting here in the snow. Some people are not even going to make it to the start line because they've been stuck all night in the snow. We luckily made it, so we're on our way to the Eco Park to register. There is a brand new race HQ for the Ark of Attrition. It's at the Ecological Park, which is still in Port Town, but just a little bit out of the main beach area. It just means there's a lot more room for people to mill about. There's a nice coffee area. There's a lot more parking. Uh, it means that that poor blue bar in, in Port Town isn't absolutely swamped every year by 200 people. So look at him. <laughs> <laughs> this guy's won this race uh, a few times, so he knows what he's doing, so it can happen to the best of as usual, the start of the Ark of Attrition 100 mile race is at Coverack, small village on the south coast of Cornwall. So we all get on buses. It is mandatory to get on the buses because they can't have hundreds of cars arriving at that tiny village. All right, so 2019 Ark of Attrition. Just getting on the bus to get to the start line. We won't film the start. I'm not taking the camera with me. The kids are going to do the filming again. It's cold and it's icy. It's really actually really much colder than I expected it to be. Okay. We'll see you later. I'll see you at, in 10 miles at um, whatever it, wherever it's called. Point. Lizard Point. Bye guys. Good luck. Because the camera was now with uh, my wife and kids, there's no film of the start of the race. I'm not going to use anybody else's footage of the start. Uh, but suffice to say, it was a little bit different than usual. Um, we started a bit further up near the car park. Uh, usually we start kind of right on the seafront. There was a big banging drum at the beginning and Andy, the race director, introduced all the elite runners to us. Um, so it was a bit more of a razzmatazz kind of affair. And then when the gun went off, we, we all ran down the hill, uh, flanked by these blue flares held up by the race marshals. So it was quite an event to start the race. The race started at midday, so I spent the next two and a half hours running along the coast to Lizard Point, which was the first point at which I met my family. It is gnarly from the very beginning. There is no messing about with this race. Once you're out of Coverack, you are straight onto the gnarly, difficult terrain. Would you say this is the first checkpoint? Yes, first meeting point. If this was further in the race, you would say it was really, really tough terrain to get over. As you're just beginning, it's not quite so bad. But running fairly steadily, fairly conservatively, just to preserve my energy for later in the race, it took me two and a half hours to get from Coverack at the start to Lizard Point, which is just over 10 miles into the race. Yeah. Perfect timing. Not bad at all, that is it. So 18 kilometers. Uh, 600, maybe 700 metres of ascent so far. Very muddy on the course today. Yeah, yeah. Um, how are you feeling? Yeah, 
how fast it is. Very fast. Molly and Co. Waiting. What time do I need to be there? Three hours, 45. One hour, one hour, one hour 15, 15 minutes. Bye guys. Love you, love you, love you lots, Bye. The next meeting point is a pretty little fishing village called Mullion Cove. Um, the running between Lizard Point and Mullion Cove is ju just as tough. Um, quite muddy on this occasion, very windy. Although the sun was out, it wasn't overly cold. It was still quite difficult running, and I think I lost a little bit of time. Yeah, and Stephen's coming down right now. As you can see, he's in the front of that group. Well done. Well done. That was a little longer than expected, but never mind. 15 minutes behind, but you're, clo yeah. you're closing the gap with people in front of you. So we're now at 29 kilometres, so uh, 18 miles, 19 miles. This is a place called Mullion Cove. Eight miles to the first official checkpoint. Eight miles to Porth Leven, which is the first official checkpoint. As I said before, you've got to be prepared if you're in a crew. We would recommend bringing a bag full of the things that you'll need for each checkpoint. All right, see you later, guys. Be love safe. you. Bye. See ya. Bye. Bye, Bye darling. Love you. So on I went making decent progress um, from Mullion Cove to the first official checkpoint at Port Leven. Last year there was a massive coastal path diversion just before Port Leven, which added an extra two miles and, and half an hour to our journey. This year that wasn't there. There is a new coast path section, much easier to run on. And uh, actually the running between uh, Mullion Cove and Port Leven is much nicer. Um, but this is the time that the sun starts to go down. The idea for me, really, the idea is to get to Porth Leven before it gets dark. And it's getting quite dark. It's starting to get dark now. Not too cold. Okay, so this is the first checkpoint to Porth Leven. Thank you. 25 miles. And uh, I'm doing alright. I'm ready for this checkpoint though. No, I think I just back, I'll, I might even carry it with me out. What? Yeah, yeah no, we'll take with you. So after the first checkpoint at Port Levin, it's a relatively short journey to the next checkpoint at Penzance. There's a little stop halfway through at Peranuthna where I briefly see my wife get a quick drink. Um, but generally, actually, it's quite flat running. And when you get to the outskirts of Penzance, uh, you're covering four, five miles of flat lit tarmac road all the way into Penzance and out of Penzance. I quite like it in a way because it breaks up the 100 miles. Um, you've, you've got the initial gnarly cliff section from the start into Penzance and then you've got this town which kind of breaks up the whole 100 miles from just before halfway and then you, you kind of get back onto the old gnarly cliffs again. So Penzance is at around about 38 miles, depends how many diversions you've done, depends how often you've gone wrong and off the trail. Yeah, that, that's a really flat bit for about four, three miles along the seafront there. And you feel like you've got to run it all, so I did run it all, so I'm quite tired now, I need a rest. But um, this is a good milestone to get to Penzance. If you get out of here, get to Land's End, you're doing good. So now we come to the section of the race where there is a little bit of a lack of footage. Partly my fault, partly my wife's fault. So you leave Penzance, it's nice and flat, you're still on the road, um, and then eventually you're leaving Penzance up onto the hills again um, and onto Lamorna Cove. I thought, well, there's no point in filming Lamorna Cove, it's quick through, we're out of there in a second, it's dark, let's just get on with it. So we went through Lamorna Cove and on to the next stop, which is Minak Theatre. If you were at Minak Theatre on Saturday morning for the start of the 50, you'll know what it looks like, absolutely beautiful part of the coast. Um, a, a kind of amphitheatre built into the rocks so you can watch a play and look out over the sea whilst you're watching it beautiful in the summertime probably not so great in the winter so we didn't film at, um, at Minak Theatre either I thought we'd wait till we get to Land's End there we can go inside, it's nice and warm, it's light we can do some filming, have a catch up, everything will be fine 
So a few wrong turns, lots of mud, lots of climbing up steps, a fair bit of running, and I made it to Land's End slightly ahead of schedule. Something like two o'clock in the morning. Anyway, I got to Land's End and my wife wasn't there, or at least I couldn't find her. She says she was there in the car park. I don't believe her. <laughs> I don't believe her. Anyway, she wasn't there. I had to rush. I didn't want to spend too long. I had a quick bowl of soup, chicken soup. Very nice. Thank you very much. Looked after very well by the Archangels, as always. And on I went. Land's End to Cape Cornwall. Uh, last year had a navigational error where I managed to come back on myself. I made sure that I followed my watch and I didn't make that same navigational error again. And there's also a navigational error. A lot of people make the mistake of missing a turn going down a hill into Senan Cove. Um, a lot of people end up on a road and wonder where on earth they are. Um, it's just a case of making sure you look at your map or making sure the GPS track on your watch is correct so that when you look at it, you know you're going in the right direction. Look, it's a self-navigation event and sometimes stuff happens that you just can't predict. Yes, in theory, keep the sea on your left and everything's fine, but honestly, it really isn't like that. There are, there are places where if you turn left, you'll go to a headland and it'll be a dead end and there's nowhere else to go. Or you turn right and you'll go all the way inland and, and I'll tell you about that in a minute. Um, so it, there are mistakes you can make. One thing you must not do is simply follow the person in front. I've learned that to my cost plenty of times. Unless, unless you know and they know exactly where they're going and you trust them, don't just blindly follow the person ahead. Last year we went off into a field somewhere because we all followed somebody. Uh, the year before that I went into brambles because I'd followed somebody just blindly not taking any notice of where I was going, just watching the person in front. Just don't do that. Be confident in your own navigational ability. It might go wrong, but at least you're the one to blame and not somebody else. After Senan Cove and onto Cape Cornwall, it, it is some of the best terrain. Honestly, you, you absolutely love it. It's, it's boulders and stuff you've just got to climb over and sometimes you don't know where the path is and you're, you're wondering if there's a massive cliff drop to your left and there probably is. It's really, really good. Um, anyway, uh, my head torch died at this point so in the pitch black I had to try and change the battery in my head torch managed to do that eventually and managed to get to Cape Cornwall where my wife cleaned my feet and I was feeling a little bit worse for wear. You'll also notice how tired I am here I say St Ives when I mean Land's End so you can see I am getting tired mental focus is not quite what it was earlier on in the race um, this is what happens we had a slight mishap at uh, St Ives. I arrived far too quickly and Victoria hadn't got there yet. And uh, I just missed her apparently. Um, so here we are at Cape Cornwall. It is about 10 to four in the morning. Five to four. Five to four in the morning. And um, I'm just having my feet cleaned. I'm, I'm starting to feel really wrecked now. So yeah, we're now, um, uh, well, we've done 102 kilometers, whatever that is, 60, 62 miles, 60 something miles, I don't know. I, like, I feel like I'm, I'm gonna be sick in a minute. Well, I think you've just pushed it a bit too. Yeah, maybe. So I've got to get to Pendine Watch Lighthouse in five miles and then there's a 13 mile slog over really, over really rough terrain to get to St Ives. But once we're at St Ives, we'll have a nice rest there and hopefully it'll be an easy 20 mile jog home. From Cape Cornwall, it's a short hop to Pendine Watch Lighthouse. Um, I was fairly conscious of time here, so I really didn't want to spend too long um, at the checkpoints, at the, the meeting points with my wife. I'd had a little bit of time at Cape Cornwall where she'd washed my feet and changed my socks and things like that. So you can see here at Pendine, I, I don't want to spend too long uh, having tea and things like that. Do you fancy a cup of tea? No, I'm good. I'll just sure? go. Yeah, I'm just going to go. This is a hot flask here if you want some. No, I... Don't, don't knock. Don't, don't is it right there? Yeah, OK. Go, go for it. Two seconds. Oh, you put your 
Tea or coffee, by the Okay, it's quarter past five in the morning. We are at Pending Watch Lighthouse, so now 13 miles, 21 kilometres, with no um, help um, until we get to St Ives. So I'm hoping to get to St Ives by at least half ten. Sure. Uh, no, that is great. No problem. Loads of people are coming to our rescue because our boiler's not lighting. <laughs> you right, Ellis? Yeah. Good lad. Elsa, are you okay? Yeah. Excellent stuff. Yeah. Crew are doing really well. You are unlikely to run in the UK on any terrain tougher than this section between Pending Watch Lighthouse and St Ives. Add to that the fact that it is mostly in the dark and add to that the unbelievable weather that then started to appear. The wind had been blowing a gale most of the night. We then had uh, rain but we also then had sideways hailstones and these were, this is not just tiny hailstones, these were marble sized hailstones for a good 10-15 minutes on and off for a good period during that whole section. So you're, you're running, well you're not really running, you are making your way over rocky, muddy, slippy, difficult terrain in the dark with hailstones sideways hitting you in the face as you go. This is not easy running guys, seriously. And stuff goes wrong and stuff went wrong for me. I was not paying attention. So I'd got about halfway into this uh, run. It was starting to get light but my mental focus was going. I wasn't looking at my watch. I climbed up a hill, then I looked at my watch and I knew I was off track. Now, rather than do the sensible thing of going back down the hill and rejoining the path, I thought, no, surely there's a way just to get back onto the coast path if I just carry on this way and just go round. I'll just get back onto the coast path. Oh no, oh no. I just kept going and kept going, no path on the left, no path on the left to get back on. The more I went, the harder it was to make the decision to turn around and go back and backtrack back to the coast path from where I came. So I just carried on going and going. Eventually there was a path off to the left, a normal public footpath, uh, through some farmer's fields which took me into the village of Zenor itself, where I asked somebody in a car park, how do I get back to the coast path? and it was literally another mile along a road before I could rejoin the coast path. I think I added half an hour and two miles to my journey, which really annoyed me at the time, but these things happen. And if you're not, again, as I said earlier, if you're not paying attention, if you've not got your eye on your GPS track or on your map, if you're not paying attention to the acorn signs that are on, I mean this, you know, it, it shouldn't be hard. There are acorn signs on posts that you can look at and they tell you where to go and it says coast path with an arrow for goodness sake. When you're tired, these things just don't happen. And I went off and I, yes, I added two miles to my journey. But there we are, it got light and eventually made it over the boulder climb, more boulder climbing again, lots of fun. I mean, it is terrific, you know, you are tired, but this is what you're there for. It's absolutely fabulous. It's, it's hard, hard work. You cannot really run very fast on this terrain, but it's just enjoyable. It's like Dan Lawson, who came second in the 50 mile race, he said it's like playing. It's like dancing through the puddles and over the rocks. That's what it's like. It's just, it's a game, but it really is such a relief to get to St Ives. Uh, thank you to the valets, the architrician valets who uh, meet you just before the checkpoint and run you in to the checkpoints. Every checkpoint there are valets that do that. Thank you to Melissa who was my valet who ran me into St Ives uh, where I could rest. You can see here that I'm tired. Um, I actually say it's taken me ten and a half hours to get here. What I mean by that is it's half past ten in the morning, not that it's taken ten and a half hours. It's actually taken me twenty-two and a half hours to get there. Okay, so finally arrived at St Ives. That was hard work, that. Sideways hail some of the time. Rain a lot of the time. Really howling gale for a lot of it. And most of that in the dark. Um, but we are here now. So I've, I've arrived here in 10 hours and 20 minutes. 
which means as long as I leave here in the next half an hour, we'll, sh we'll get under 30 hours for the whole run. Uh, we've travelled 132 kilometres. There are one or two steep tarmac sections getting out of St Ives itself, but then it's flat running all the way round the bay into Hale. Um, I sometimes briefly say hello to my wife there and grab a quick drink, uh, and then it's on to the dunes of doom. The dunes of doom, when I first did it, were not way marked, so um, the uh, staff at Ark of Attrition put uh, glow sticks through so you could find your way through. Uh, now they've been replaced by big slabs of stone marking every two, three hundred metres through the dunes. And as long as you keep your eyes out for those markers, then you will find your way through the dunes fairly easily. I don't relish the idea of doing it in the dark, though, as the Arc 50 runners had to do. So the next section you see me arrive at after the dunes of doom is Godrevy. Godrevy is around about 11, 12 miles from home. So this is God Revy and we've got two more, well no, we've got one more stop to go before the finish. 11 miles to go. Okay. You need anything? I've got to uh, yeah. From Godrevy you climb back up onto the cliffs from the beach and you go past Hell's Mouth which is a well-known tourist spot and all the way along to uh, Portreath. Compared to what's gone before it is relatively easy running, it's fairly flat most of the way apart from a little sting just before you get into Portreath uh, where you, there's two down and ups. One little one, you go down and you go up some steps and then another big valley. You go all the way down into this valley and all the way back up again. Absolutely kills you. Um, with six miles to go, that really hurts. But finally you drop down into Patrith and, and here I am at the final meeting point with my wife. So this is Patrith, which is a nice uh, beach kind of town. Um, I've got five miles to go. so slow on the last section but well, I'll get in under 29 hours hopefully so obviously by now I knew I was going to get um, well as long as nothing disastrous happened I knew I was going to get under 30 hours um, if I continued to run relatively well I would get um, a PB but I was really shattered by now um, I hadn't been going the speed that I'd really wanted to go from St Ives all the way to Patrith. I'd, I'd been really quite slow uh, and I was a bit disappointed in my speed over that terrain. So I did pick it up a little bit. I just tried to run in the last four miles, five miles from Patrith into Port Town. Um, there's a different finish now to the Arc of Attrition. It used to end at the Blue Bar on the beach at Porth Town, but now you have to run down the hill all the way out of Porth Town and then up another hill to the finish. So it adds another mile onto the run. At this point, I was on for a finish of 28 hours and 30 minutes. I wanted to just try and sneak under 28.30, so I was really pushing it to try and do that. <laughs> You've done it! Daddy! Daddy! Excuse me. I've finished. My God, I've finished. <laughs> well done. The mud crew does it again with that hill at the end. We like to call it the sting in the tail. Oh, that was that. High five, Daddy. I, I imagined a hill. I didn't imagine anything like that. Horrible, isn't Horrible. it? Come in, we'll get your finisher photo. Those tears at the end, a lot of you will recognise, will understand. 
100 miles is a long way. 100 miles with much of it, almost half of it, in the dark is harder still. Given the terrain, given the weather that we had, it is an absolute relief to cross the finish line. It's a relief that you've crossed it in the first place, that you haven't been injured, you haven't fallen to your death down a cliff, you haven't had to pull out because you've been sick, because you fainted, because... But for any number of reasons, you might DNF a race like that. There's a massive outpouring of emotion that happens at that moment that you cross the finish line. You're just so incredibly grateful and happy and relieved to cross that finish line without any disasters happening. That's what those tears are about. And they're also an immense sense of satisfaction and pride and achievement. And it's a great, it is a great feeling. It's a, it's a feeling that you don't get very often in life. And those, those tears are absolutely not embarrassing to me at all. It's just something that I do when I've had, you know, it's not, it doesn't happen every race, it doesn't happen every race, but it happens on those races where I've really been through the ringer and it's really meant a lot to get to that finish line. Great job, buddy. You, I had nothing for that last 20 miles. You two flew away. Brilliant job. Really good. Is that, is that Laura? Hello, did you win, darling? Oh, well done, you. Good girl. Well, fa fastest time. Um, 28 and a half. Just over. Because that bloody hill at the end. But, um, yeah, I mean, I had a little plan for 27 hours that I thought I probably am not trained up enough for that time. And true enough, I wasn't. But I went out, I went out with that in mind and I got to the last 20. Once I'd left St Ives, I had nothing left. And there was a lot of struggling that last 20. This is Laura, by the way. Laura won today. She's, and now she, how long have you been there? Oh, Since you finished. Quite, it's quite standard. <laughs> it's a normal occurrence. Bonjour. You love it, don't you? <laughs> how are you, Jean? I'm good. Yeah? How are you? I'm, yeah, knackered. But, fine. Oh, well done, Stephen. Thank you, Laura. So, we are at the Ecological Park, which is the new finish of the Arc of Attrition. A 100 mile race, 104, 106, because if you go the wrong way, you add plenty of miles. Um, but once again, we finished, once again, we've got a gold buckle, so we can't be anything but happy with that. And I'm going to drink coffee and have a long, long bath. So the next morning we all gathered back at the Ecological Park for the prize giving. Massive congratulations to Kim Collison who managed to come in in a new course record time and uh, here he is. So this is, this is Kim who was the winner of the R100 this year. Yeah, did you enjoy it? I mean it's, it's a hard old gnarly course isn't it today? Yeah, no, I really enjoyed it. I mean, there were sections I didn't, like the road sections, because that's not my preferred thing. And but I really loved that first section in the daylight with the most of views. And, uh, and I did like the bit up before St. Ives. Um, just the, the train suited me with the, the technical, the boulder hopping. Did you enjoy the weather? Uh, I thought it was not too bad. Four o'clock in the morning, horizontal <laughs> hailstones. <laughs> well, was a, a brief spell, you know, it was over in five minutes. <laughs> All right, it's felt like half an hour today. Yeah, well, okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, Kim. Thank Thank you. Well done. Thank you. And the winner of the ARC 100 2019, in a time, I'm really sorry it's not a course record, <laughs> which is the first thing you said to me when you crossed the line, actually. In 26 hours, 48 minutes and 30 seconds, representing the Mud Crew Opera team is Laura Swanton. of the 2019 ARC 100 
in a fantastic time and a new course record of 20 hours, 43 minutes and 46 seconds, representing Team Raid Life is Kim Collinson. <laughs> So the finish line's been taken down. We're all going home. It's a beautiful, sunny morning here in Porth Town. And uh, that is it for the ARC 100 and the ARC 50 as well. We've had an absolutely amazing time. Managed to get a PB, 28 hours, 31 minutes, 39 seconds, something like that. Approximately, around about that. Might have been a bit quicker if I hadn't gone off to Zenor and added an extra mile to my journey, but that is the way it is with the Ark. It's just an adventure. If you, if you have even the slightest inkling that you might like to try it, you've got to sign up, really. The Ark is an amazing event. So that's it. Do subscribe to the Film My Run YouTube channel and we'll see you again for another adventure, another ultra, another marathon next time. Take care. Bye bye.